We are at the site of America's first Shaker settlement. Um, this is where the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing were first able to realize their vision of creating a communal, utopian, religious society in America. Um, the Shakers started in the mid-1700s in Manchester, England. People derisively referred to them as the Shakers, which was a reference to their early worship, which consisted of shaking, um, crawling around on the floor, barking like dogs. They weren't the only group, uh, religious group doing this sort of thing in that time period. It was an ecstatic kind of um, expression of, of worship. Some of them had been Quakers in the past, None of them were happy with the existing religions of the time, and so they were meeting together discussing uh, matters of spirituality, and all of them agreed that they believed that to, in order to live a pure life, Christian life, um, that you had to be celibate, you should own property in common, so communal ownership of property. They believed in pacifism and confession of sin as well. So those are the basic tenets of the Shaker faith and those remain consistent throughout their history. And out of this group of, of people who were discussing spirituality in Manchester came a young woman named Anne Lee. Um, she was the daughter of a blacksmith and she had been forced into a marriage she wasn't interested in having in the first place and then subsequently had four children all of whom died in infancy or um, you know when they were quite young. So uh, she was particularly drawn to the concept of celibacy because it was a way to free her from the cycle of, of grief. She was the one who ultimately brought them to the new world to practice their religion freely. Um, so they came to America in 1774 and they stayed in Manhattan for a couple years and fled to the Albany area just as the British were in invading um, Manhattan. Um, they were able to lease a parcel of land that was quite undesirable. It was all swamp land and sand dunes and that sort of thing. Um, but this was a poor group of people. They didn't have a lot of money. So this was the first place they were able to settle themselves. And they became successful fairly quickly. By 1790, they had established the, the garden seed industry. So they were among the first to standardize seed production, put the seeds in paper packets, and sell them to the outside world. Um, so they very quickly became very astute and successful business people. They made use of the Erie Canal to ship their products um, to the West, um, so their influence was pretty great. Um, later on, they also had a tremendous influence in the area of the arts. Um, the Shakers are perhaps best known for their furniture, the ladder back chairs. It was only the chairs that they mass produced and sold to the outside world, but the standardized mass production of these chairs was pretty early on. Early on. This community peaked, um, as most Shaker communities did, in about the mid-1800s. And at that time, there were about 300 people living here. And it would have been like a beehive of activity. There were many, many buildings here at the site um, that unfortunately were, were torn down uh, in the early 20th century. Um, but you can really um, see it as, as a mini industrial village. It was, was densely developed. Every building had a specific use. Every shaker had a specific job that they were assigned to. And there was a tremendous amount of activity. They were celibate. So they had to have a way of getting new converts. And one of the things that they did was um, build these large scale meeting houses like the one back here behind us. The meeting house was built in 1848. And on Sundays, the road would literally be filled from beginning to end with carriages of people who came to see the Shakers. Um, in part because it was a curiosity. Victorians loved a spectacle and they considered the Shakers to be a very interesting spectacle. But some people came because they truly were um, motivated by Shaker spirituality and interested in their faith. And there were people who came to see Shaker worship who subsequently converted. Um, they would ha frequently have many famous guests here. Um, Martin Van Buren was their lawyer. He was frequently a guest who would come on Sundays to observe Shaker wor worship. General Sherman came, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Herm Herman Melville. In fact, Melville has a character from this community in Moby Dick. 
um, who makes an appearance in one of the chapters. So um, it was quite the thing to do in the mid 19th century to come and see Shaker worship. After Anne Lee died, um, she had appointed um, somebody to succeed her, which is one of the reasons why the Shaker faith was able to continue. She had the foresight to appoint somebody to succeed her. And that was a man named Joseph Meacham. Um, and both Anne Lee and Joseph Meacham are buried in the cemetery here at this site. And if you look at Anne Lee, um, you know, she is never put on a pedestal. She is the founder of the Shaker faith in America. But if you look at her tombstone in the cemetery, it's just slightly larger than the others. So she wasn't necessarily considered to be better or more important than anyone else. They, they really did strive for equality in the communities. Joseph Meacham is the one who really came up with the um, way that Shaker communities were organized into separate family groupings. And for the Shakers, they had a very different concept of what a family is than we do. Because they lived communally, a family was a hundred people who were living and working together and worshiping in harmony. Um, so entire families sometimes would join the community, but they were expected to love everyone equally. So they were expected to break family bonds to a certain extent because they were joining a new type of family. Um, so the Shakers often were accused of breaking up families, but from their perspective, they actually were providing a, a new kind of family. The Shakers were very progressive in their, their ideals. They believed in gender and racial equality. So from the very beginning, we know that there were black Shakers, you know, as early as 1790. I was very curious about um, black Shakers, and we can't say that there were legions of them, but there certainly were a good number of black Shakers, and they truly were treated as equals in the community. Um, so we don't have a researcher on staff, so we've worked with students at the SUNY Albany Public History Program at Siena College and other, other colleges in the area to go through the Shaker journals and identify African American Shakers and start to piece together a story about them. So we had a student from SUNY Albany who found six sp specific references to the Shakers sheltering fugitive slaves, which was quite a surprise to me because the Shakers were always pretty savvy about politics and not putting themselves in a position where they'd get in trouble needlessly. So I assumed they wouldn't be writing specific things in their journals about sheltering fugitive slaves, but the student came across a reference that was something to the effect that Brother F took a runaway slave to Schenectady to help them on to freedom in Canada, which is really quite astonishing because you don't really come up with that kind of concrete evidence when you're studying the Underground Railroad. So we are continuing to build on that, that research and to get a better understanding of what it was like if you were a black person living in the, in the community. The Shakers took in a lot of orphans and they took in poor people and that was one way that they increased their numbers. Um, they were never particularly firm about proselytizing and trying to get people to join the community. I think because they knew that um, everybody had to fully agree to commit to this lifestyle, otherwise it wouldn't work. Um, so by the late 19th century, um, there were state-run orphanages, government-run orphanages that were being established. So there were fewer reasons to place your children with the Shakers or an orphan child with the Shakers. Also, as women were able to um, earn a living on their own, more opportunities became available for women, there were less uh, economic reasons to join the Shakers. And in general, interest in spirituality started to diminish. Um, so by 1925, there were just a handful of Shakers left in Albany, and they were having a great difficulty maintaining all of the buildings and the site here. So Albany County purchased the land from the Shakers um, so that they could use it as a sanitarium for tuberculosis patients and so that they could build a new nursing home. And this is fairly common. A lot of Shaker communities were closing down in that time period and many of them were used for institutional purposes, for prisons or, or what have you. So today, there are nine buildings left in the church family uh, portion of the historic district, and many of them have had their interiors um, altered by Albany County, but we still have the 1848 Shaker Meeting House, 
um, which is the last large scale meeting house with its interior left intact. So that's quite significant. It's, it's a beautiful building. You can really get a sense of, of the history of the place.